All right, we're, uh, we're in a new series called The Dysfunctional Lovable Church. That's us. The church is lovable, and it is dysfunctional, and we are lovable, and we are dysfunctional, and the church has always been that way. We're going to find. I love doing series like this where we are just plowing through a book of the Bible. We're going through 1 Corinthians, and uh, I like this because, honestly, though it breaks my heart, you, you are not going to remember most any of these sermons uh, a year from now, maybe a month from now. <laughs> uh, but when you go through a book of the Bible and you start hearing theme after theme after theme after theme, the same theme over and over again, uh, you'll remember that theme. And when you go back to 1 Corinthians to read it in your time of, of, with the Lord later in life, you'll remember some of these themes. And so uh, that's pretty cool and pretty fun about going through a book of the Bible. So up on the screen is just a, a couple of the themes that we have been uh, that we've been going over. Uh, I should say uh, these are sorry, I'm getting my bearings a little bit still up here with the, the stand up mic. Um, these are all from the end of chapter two. So these are from our sermon from last week as chapter two ended. Uh, these are themes that we see from chapter two it says we have obey the spirit of God, not the spirit of this world. So uh, we're talking about obeying God's spirit, not the spirit of the world. There is a spirit of the world. Satan is the spirit of this world. Satan is, is active, and uh, I just read in 1 Peter how he's a roaring lion seeking to devour us, and we are to resist him, and that's real, right? That's, that's real. So uh, 1 Corinthians is talking about obeying the spirit of God, not the spirit of this world, and the end of chapter 2 talked about how the way of Jesus is considered foolish by the wisdom of this world. And so we've talked quite a lot about that the last two weeks. The way of Jesus, it seems foolish. The world says, why would you live that way? And then it ends with, we have the mind of Christ. Now, uh, a, a friend of mine and I were, were doing some prayer and some accountability, and, and um, we reminded each other that we are not citizens of this world's kingdom, that we are citizens of God's kingdom. And when you're a citizen of a kingdom, you have a king, and you obey that king. And the, citizen, the kingdom of this world is run by Satan, and it's run by powers of this world and powers and principalities the Bible talks about, and, and, and that is not our kingdom. And we have to remember that when we go, man, all my friends are living this way, or everybody on TV is living this way, or everybody online is living this way. I think I'm just going to end up living that way. Our citizenship is elsewhere. We, we are American citizens, but we are citizens of God's kingdom. He is our ultimate king, and we are ultimately accountable and responsible to him. And so Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's saying, y'all better start living like it. He's writing to Christians who aren't living like God is their king. So these are the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 3, and these are really, really strong language uh, to the church. Imagine if I started a sermon like this. He says, brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. So I get up here and I go, yo, church, you're a bunch of infants and you're worldly, <laughs> okay? He's talking to Christian people here. He's talking to saved Christian baptized churchgoers, and he's saying, you're worldly, and you're infants. Sometimes when I preach, I get a little thirsty, so I just need to take a little drink. Hold on. I get a little parched sometimes. So we need to let this soak in, because in 2023, when I look at the church nationally and I read Christian Twitter, I say, the church doesn't look like Jesus, right? And you look at politics today and you go, the church doesn't look like Jesus. People that claim to be Christians are not acting like Jesus in the public square, let alone in the private square. We have to look at it nationally. We have to look at Mosaic, and we have to say, if someone from the outside looks at Mosaic, do they see Jesus? Do they see Jesus in the way that we operate as a church, in the things we value as a church? Do they see Jesus? And of course, individually, do people see Jesus in our life? Do people see Jesus in our life? Is it hot in here? Because I'm just thirsty. I don't know. I just, I'm thirsty. It's just, that's hit. It's hitting the spot. 
It's hitting the spot today. Now, this is a picture of my daughter, Sage. She didn't know I was going to show this. She'll probably be embarrassed. She's nine years old now. In this picture, I don't know how old she is. She's just little and cute. When a, when a baby eats baby food, it's cute. It's cute. Look at her. She's cute. I don't know what she's eating, some brown mush, and it's all over her, and she's just having a good old time uh, with her spoon. It is cute when a baby eats baby food, but when an adult eats baby food, it's not cute. So I got this jar of sweet potato baby food from Hannah Baxter. I'm, I did not ask Bryce uh, to bring me baby food because he would have brought me like chicken or beef. You know what I'm saying? But I did, I said, Give, bring me a vegetable. If I eat fruit, it's just too easy. I can't get up there and eat applesauce, you know? So um, I don't know, if I had chicken or beef, I don't think I could do this. I don't know if I can do this. But I'm gonna try it. Okay, milk says it's a good idea, Christy. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, when an adult eats, when a baby eats baby food though, you know that they don't just get it in their mouth, they kind of do this with it. And I'm not wearing a bib, so it's gonna be a little hard to do. But they kind of end up looking like this by the end of it. By the way, this is my baby spoon when I was little. It's got Snoopy on it. Isn't that cute? Now, if, we, if you and I went out to lunch, and this is what I did, what would you think? Oh, they do this too. They don't like put it in their mouth. They go, they go like this. And it falls down their mouth. Every good parent has a basket full of wipes ready. I might need some after. I don't know if these paper towels are going to get done or note, notebook paper, paper towels. <laughs> if I were to preach the rest of my sermon like that, I have a feeling that it would be distracting. <laughs> I don't know if I got it all. <laughs> Somebody help me out. Did I get it all, Josh? You're not going to help me. <laughs> Hannah, will you help me? Will you be my mom? Am I good? <laughs> From here, it looks good. We got that HD camera over there, I'm sure. I'm still thirsty, though. <laughs> Can you imagine being at a, a mosaic cookout, and we're having ribs and turkey knuckles, and I'm over here in the corner eating mushed sweet potatoes all over my face? That would not be cute, would it? It would be really, really wrong. Like, you, you would look at me and say, something is wrong with him. Like, there's no reason a 40-year-old man should be eating baby food and eating out, drinking out of a baby bottle. There is no reason a 40-year-old man should be doing that. I, I, zero. Right? There's zero reason. Even if you had to eat this food for some reason, you shouldn't be eating it like this as a 40-year-old adult. Paul is saying that this is what's going on in the church of Corinth— and it's really, really wrong. You have people who say they're Christians, people who should be mature in their faith and eating meat, and he's saying, I had to come and give you the baby food. I had to come and give you the milk because you're infants in Christ. You're still worldly, and this is not good. The, the, you're walking around with baby food all over your face, and here's the thing. You're all doing it. Hey, look, what if everybody in this room looked like I just did a minute ago? You all had sweet potato all over your face. You're all drinking out of baby bottles, and you thought that was so cool and fun. And over here, we're serving milk bottles and, and, and mushed peas, and we put that on our website. That's what the Church of Corinth is doing. It would take someone strong, like Paul, coming in and saying, no, you're, that's not what adult Christian living is supposed to look like. And if you think it's cool and you think you're getting by, trust me, God does not see it that way. God does not see it that way. And I'll be honest, this is nasty. I would much rather eat ribs, <laughs> okay? I would much rather eat the real food, the good food, you guys. Satan is not giving you something better He's given you something way, way, way worse. 
All right, I got some questions for you. These are not deep and theological, uh, but they, they do, they will dive us into what we just talked about and then where we're going with an illustration we're going to do next. So get back in your groups, and for five or six minutes, uh, does anyone in your group like to eat baby food? I know after my demonstration, uh, you probably would be way too embarrassed to say so, but I know some people that like that. Maybe you like the fruit flavor. You're like, oh, that little raspberry applesauce is pretty good. So if you do, just say so. And, but if you don't, if you don't like to eat baby food, say why. Why do you not like to eat baby food? I really want to get some details there. And then secondly, uh, what is your favorite restaurant and why? Why is it your favorite restaurant? So give sp some specifics on your favorite restaurant. Try to describe it. Describe the ambiance, the vibe, the food, the service, whatever it is. Try to sell your group on your favorite restaurant and, and why they should come check it out. I'll, uh, I'll be back in the next uh, five or six minutes. All right. We're going to pick up in the text in 1 Corinthians 3. You're welcome to turn there in your Bible if you have one. By the way, we have a whole table of free Bibles over here. Lots of expensive study Bibles. Quezon saw these and is like, oh, I could sell that one. Uh, well, you're not allowed to sell them, but these are actually really expensive Bibles. If you buy some of these in the store, they're like 80 bucks. So if you want a really thick study Bible that has a lot of helps in it, uh, we just had a bunch donated and just encourage you to check that out uh, before you leave. Uh, but you can open up your Bible, paper Bible, uh, your, your app on your phone, or you can follow along as we have them up here on the screen. Um, verse 3, we just read the beginning of it uh, a minute ago, but it says, You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere humans? That phrase stands out to me, mere humans. Uh, or uh, for, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being mere human beings? And th those phrases, mere humans, mere human beings, strike me because what they tell me is we were meant to be more than mere humans. What, what is a mere human? I think a mere human is just someone that follows the metrics of the world, the things of the world that the world tells us are important, we follow. You have to kind of, sometimes I, I ask myself, what's the difference between a human and an animal? Like an animal gratifies their, their sexual desires, gratifies their hunger when they're hungry. An animal, often it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You've heard that phrase before where it's, a, it's, a, it's you know, the survival of the fittest or a, I'm going to be the king of that mountain. This is my territory. This is my turf. And you got to ask, is that how humans act? Do we, are we just existing to fulfill our own desires, our own needs, our own wants? And then when it comes to others, uh, they're our competition. I mean, just what does it mean to be a mere human versus having a purpose and a meaning that's greater than that? A greater purpose for our lives that God has for us. I think there really is an emptiness and a shallowness when we miss what really matters. God offers us what really matters, and you can live your whole life. You know the old bumper sticker, uh, the man who dies with the most toys wins, and then there's the counter bumper sticker, the man who dies with the most toys still dies. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, there's this idea that you can, you can live for the wrong things, and at the end of your life go, man, what, what did I invest in? What did I invest my life in? And that's what Paul's trying to get the church to wake up to. And again, remember, He's talking to Christians. He says, you're still worldly. You're living like mere humans. He's not talking to the non-Christians saying you need to accept Jesus. He's saying you've accepted Jesus and you're living like you haven't. And so we just need to, we need to wake up to some of this strong warning that Paul is giving. Verse 5 and 6, he says, what after all is Apollos and what is Paul? These were leaders in the church that they were arguing and bickering about. Uh, only servants, only servants through whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned each to his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So he's talking about church celebrities here. We talked about this quite a bit, I think, two weeks ago in 1 Corinthians 1. Uh, th there's this celebrityism that invaded the church, and the celebrityism was taking the focus off of Jesus. And we do that in the church today all the time. We, we, we focus on our celebrity pastor or preacher or worship leader or a church brand, and your, the brand gets really big, and then 10, 20 years later, a documentary comes out about that brand and, and how corrupt it was and how we were covering up all this sexual abuse or how it was this ego-driven church and it became about the brand. It became about the personalities and they lost sight of Jesus. 
and Jesus' metrics, this hidden sacrificial surrender. The first will be last. Um, die to yourself. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. These are the ways of Jesus. This is a big theme from the last two sermons that we've been talking about. So Paul's trying to get him to understand here that a pastor, a preacher, a minister, Paul, Apollos, are just servants. He actually says only servants. And today we don't really have a, a construct for what a servant was in the first century. It was a pretty demeaning job. A, a servant wasn't your job. It was your role in life. I mean, it was who you were. And so, uh, and I won't get into all of the history of it, but you can just Google or, or get, a, get, a, get a study Bible and, and learn about servanthood in the first century. And it was a, bit, a little bit above slavery, but these, these servants would have been bonded to their master. They would have, they would have served in the lowliest jobs around the house. And, and he's saying, this is what a pastor is. This is what a preacher is. This is what a minister is, except they are servants of the Most High God. So we as Christians are meant to be servants of the Most High God. And I got this picture of God's high uh, court in my head, whatever that looks like. You have God, and you're at, you're at his court, not the judge court, but I mean like the king, and he's on his throne, and the king's court is in front of you, and we are all there uh, as his servants, and God is on his throne, and you, you'd have to ask, where should the attention be in that room? It should be on God, most high king, but within the, 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 the court of the king, What's actually happening is the servants are boasting and bragging about how sweet they are, and they're trying to recruit the other servants to come follow them, and bragging and broadcasting and expanding their platform about how wonderful they are as leaders and teachers and ministers, and all the servants are going, wow, they are. I'm going to go over here. I'm going to go over and follow Josh. I'm going to go over and follow Victoria. And, you, and God is up on the throne like, um... Is this thing on? <laughs> like, guys, I'm up here. Like, I'm God. And you're, you're what, are, what are you doing? What are you doing? That's what Paul's trying to get the church to understand when our focus gets off of Jesus. And he, he's giving these very servant-like tasks. I planted the seed. Apollos watered the seed. These pretty uh, basic tasks. And he says, but God has been making it grow. God is the one that does the work. God is the one that does the work in your life. He does the work in my life. And how many times have we planted the seed and watered it and then tried to make it grow? I am guilty of that. I am guilty of that. And you plant the seed and you water it. And I'm really stuck on this. Oh, this is so hard for me to be on this mic stand. But you plant the seed and you water it. I'm free a little bit. I'm going to plant it in the ground and I'm going to water it. And then the next day, I run out and say, okay, where's my, where's my vegetable? Where's my fruit? Where is it? It's not there? Okay, I'll, I'll wait a day, God. And I come back out, and it's not there. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to help it. I'm going to help it. You know what? I bet if I dig in there and I pull it real hard, then I'll grow a tomato. Does that work, LaRonda? It doesn't work, does it? LaRonda's a master gardener. No, it doesn't. We can't do anything to make the fruit grow besides setting the environment, being faithful, and the miracle is done by God. And I say that to me as pastor with a heavy burden on my heart for you and many people who aren't in this room right now. And I say it for you, for family members that your heart is breaking for, for close friends that your heart is breaking for, and you're saying, when are they going to wake up? When are they going to see Jesus? I don't know. But God has been making it grow. And we pray for them, and we plant the seed, and we water the seed, and we go back to summer lights, and we plant the seed, and we water the seed, and we go to the Boys and Girls Club, and we plant the seed, and we water the seed, and we do cookouts, and we plant the seed, and we water the seed, but God makes it grow. And I am preaching to myself right now, trust me, trust me. Trust me. All right, next verse, verse 7. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. For we, we, Paul, Apollos, your favorite celebrity preacher or worship leader, whoever it is, fill in the blank, you, me, all of us in this room are co-workers in God's service. 
co-workers in God's service. One, I love, let me, let, me, let me talk about the positive of being a co-worker in God's service. We have a job to do on this earth, and we get to build God's kingdom. That's our job, is building God's kingdom. I, I like to accomplish things, um, but in my own strength, what I can accomplish is pretty small. What we get to do is be a part of a global church throughout 2,000 years of building God's kingdom. And that in glory, when we're with Jesus, we're going to look at his kingdom and we're going to say, I helped build that because I was a co-worker. Is that not a great feeling? Look, I've been on sports teams where I sat the bench the whole year. And guess what? We won the championship and I got the t-shirt. And I got the free spaghetti dinners. And I was a part of the team. And that's better than not being on the team. It's better than losing. But it's a whole lot better when you're on the field. And when you're sweaty and dirty and grass stains and bloody and you're like, I'm the one that put the points up on the board. Not in your own strength, but as a part of the team. As a part. And the beautiful thing about God's kingdom is there's no cuts. Praise God. There's... You choose if you want to sit the bench. There's no coach putting you there. It is up to us if we want to cross over the sideline and get on the field or if we want to stay on the bench. Completely our choice. And at the end of the day, we will look back at all God's trophies and we'll know I was a part of that one or I wasn't. I chose to sit the bench on that one. I want you to think back to your favorite restaurant, whatever you talked about in your group, whatever your favorite restaurant was. And, dis- and I want you to think about the description of the experience of the restaurant. What was it that made the restaurant your favorite? The food, the service, uh, you know, the ambiance, all of those things. And, and so when, when Paul talks about being co-workers in God's service, I couldn't help but think of the modern American church. And, and please know, I'm not talking here about you guys, about Mosaic. Um, I don't see my notes here somewhere. I'll just say it now. We, we have such an amazing team, an amazing group, and everybody's, for the most part, volunteering and active and, and doing things to help the church. When I look at the American church, I've worked in a lot of churches now. So I get, I'm getting older. I've been around the block a few times. I've worked at a lot of churches. I know tons of people that work in churches, uh, pastors and staff. And I do think that in the American church, in the modern church, we treat it like a restaurant. Okay, we treat it like a restaurant. You go to church, and the staff does the work, and you pay your bill when the offering plate comes around, and you talk about how the food was with your friends. You leave a three-star review on Yelp, and you say, I'm taking my services elsewhere, or whatever it may be. Um, The staff serves the customers, and the people in the church are the customers. That's, That's American church. Paul's like, no, 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 that's not the church. We are all, as Christians, co-workers in Christ. So do you guys know what a co-op is? A co-op? A a co-op is a business, uh, and I could have some of this wrong, just pretend like I'm right, Um, okay? Uh, (laughs) um, Quote me on that, that'll be a good line. Uh, So uh, there's not like an owner-owner, but all the employees are owners. So the the, the employees are co-owners of the business. So everybody working there has a share in the company, and however good the company does, instead of some CEO at the top being the one getting rich, you know, uh, and everyone else is working for minimum wage, it's, it's shared. And so the employees are all owners, and when you own something, what do you do? You put a lot of pride in it because it's got your name on it. You own it, and they're all working together, and everybody's sharing the profits. That's a co-op. All right, so that's what Paul, I think, is saying here. He's saying we're, we're co-workers. The co is important because he's saying Paul, Apollos, me and you are co. We are co-workers together in the church for God's kingdom. So imagine being in a co-op. You work at a co-op, and uh, only a handful of people are doing the work. You're all in the co-op. You're all sharing the profits, and there's 20 of you, but only five of you are doing the work, and you're one of the five. How do you feel? You'd be exhausted. You feel taken advantage of. You feel a little bit frustrated. Paul is a little bit frustrated here when he's writing the letter to Corinth. Because the church is not a restaurant. Yes, we we want it to be a place where lost people can come in and, and, and eat. And eat. Jesus. I mean, Jesus says he's the bread of life. We want them to taste and see that the Lord is good. But we're not getting people saved of wear the jersey and to be a fan up in the stands. You wear the jersey to get on the field, 
to have a purpose and a meaning that is greater than any purpose and meaning that Satan or the world can give you. Amen? I mean, that is it. And again, I, I, I don't mean doing more at Mosaic. I mean doing it in your life, saying, what am I living for? What is my purpose and meaning? And is it focused on Jesus Christ and his kingdom, the spirit of God, or is it focused on something else? Is it focused on something else? And so Paul's frustrated, and he's calling them infants, and he's calling them of the world, because that's how they're living their life, as spectators, as customers in the restaurant, rather than as someone who's putting on the apron to cook the food, to serve the tables, to go out and find the broken, the bleeding, the bruised, and to say, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And getting the sweat and the dirt and the grass stain on your jersey with somebody who's down and out and saying, Jesus loves you. That's the work of the church. That's the work of the church. So we're, um, I already said that. Props to Mosaic. Uh, we have such a high percentage of volunteers, and I love that. I, but I think we have to call out the church in America um, still. I think that's what Paul's doing. Uh, and, and we have to get away from this idea of let the professionals do the ministry. Um, the Bible says it's priesthood of all believers. We're all pastors. We're, we're priest was a, a very, uh, would be like the pastor of the Old Testament. Um, we don't have time to get into that, but that's the work of the church. So I want you to ask yourself a couple challenging questions. Who's the last person you shared your faith with? Don't answer out loud. Just think about it in your head. Who's the last person you shared your faith with? Who's the last person that you, uh, that you helped that was bruised, bleeding, broken? And, and you came alongside of them and helped. I grew up in church with a lot of thou shalt nots. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do this. I grew up with a fair amount of you need to believe this. So believe these things, don't do these things. Not a lot of thou shalts. Not a lot of here's how to gain ground for the kingdom. So what we're trying to do, I'm going to give a shout out to Summer Lights, our little kiosk over there. We had 52 kids this last week. Um, amen to that. Um, I'll be real. I was one of the seven volunteers there. It was hard doing 52 kids with seven. It's hard. It was fine. But I had, I think, 12 middle school kids in my small group. You know how much gospel you get done with 12? Let me, let me correct that. Fourth through eighth grade boys in a park, 12 of them, and I'm trying to talk about Jesus. You can only imagine. Um, but if I only had four of them, I promise you, we would have had deep we would have had deep conversations about life and the gospel and Jesus. Because that's how it was all last summer. Four or five kids in a group, man, you are going deep. We're talking about God, Jesus. You get over seven or eight, man, they, <laughs> somebody help me out, parents. With, you know, their, their brain is off with the birds. I mean, they have no physical way of paying attention in that moment. And so it, it's not a matter of guilt or shame and people are busy. It's just saying, look, we have an opportunity that God has given us. We've got 52 kids coming to the park. And, and they, you heard the girl in the video. She's like, we, we didn't prompt her to say that. She's just like, we're talking about Jesus. I want to talk about Jesus more. The world is thirsty for Jesus. How could they not be? The world is so empty, you guys. Satan has nothing to offer people but more numbing. How long can you numb yourself until you realize there's nothing inside? I'm just numbing the emptiness. There's nothing filling it. The world is empty and thirsty. Sundays, great. Small groups are great. But we need to know that we are filled up so we can pour out to the world. We are filled up so we can pour out to the world. You are filled up to pour out to the world. It doesn't have to be at Summer Lights, but you are filled up to pour out to the world. And if you aren't doing that, there is a digestion problem. Okay? Digestion problems are painful. We, we, are, we are not meant to be a pond, a stagnant water pond where the water never moves. You ever see a beautiful waterfall on a rushing creek? It's beautiful. You ever see a stagnant pond with flies buzzing around it, algae growing on the water? Because it doesn't move. It doesn't go anywhere. That's not God's design for the church. All right, so let me say this before we're done. It is okay to be an infant. Theo needs this body. Thanks for sharing your bottle with me, Theo, wherever you are, brother. This is Theo's bottle, man. This, no, this is milk from my fridge. That's weird. That's weird. Stop it. Stop it, Josh. Who let him in here? 
Can we, do we have like a, gre- a greeter that can take care of him? Okay. <laughs> infants need milk. Look, when you're a new Christian, you are an infant. It is okay to be an infant. Let me just say it is okay to come to the church and eat and not do anything. It is okay to come and learn. I am not giving my car keys to baby Theo. That would not go well. Or to Alejandro. Sorry, Alejandro. I am not doing that. That would be hilarious, though, wouldn't it? Oh, my goodness. If it wasn't my car, if it was like Demolition Derby, oh, my goodness. Look, what I'm saying is it is okay to be uncomfortable going to Summer Lights. It's okay to be uncomfortable helping someone. It's okay to be uncomfortable sharing your faith. It's scary. But we do it with grace. You don't have to be perfect at it. And we do it gradually. So I'm teaching Brooklyn, my five-year-old, how to ride a bike. She's scared. She's scared of the training wheels. I don't put her on the bike, take the training wheels off, and fly her down her driveway and say, Ha ha, sucker! Somebody get that on video! We're going to play that at your open house. No, it's gradual. It's loving. Wear a helmet. I'm right here. I'm holding on to the seat. I'm holding on to you. I know how to ride a bike. I've been, I've been, I, don't, I, don't, I don't typically drink from bottles <laughs> and eat baby food. As a parent, I know how to teach you, my child. And in the, that's the church. There's mothers and fathers in the church. Next week's sermon, Paul says in chapter 4, he's like, there's not enough fathers among you. Speaking of Father's Day, he's talking about spiritual fathers and spiritual mothers. There's not enough fathers in your church. There's not enough mothers in your church. Can you be a spiritual mother and father in this church? And it's okay if you're an infant. It's not okay if you're a mother father and you're acting like an infant. But it is totally okay to be scared of this stuff and to say, I just need someone to hold my hand and help me with it. And, and, and I will say at Summer Lights, it is gradual. We're not throwing you into the deep end. We're not throwing you into, uh, into the shark tank. There, there is very gradual ways of just getting out to the park and being like, whoa, this is cool. This isn't a church. And we're, <laughs> we're doing God's work. Right, a couple more verses here. i got to wrap up. Um, it's all Josh's fault. He gets me going. Oh, man, I got, I got all these slides I'm not going to be able to get to. All right, let's see what we get to. All right. Um, skipping this one. Skip. <laughs> Alan is shocked. He is shocked. Go to verse 16 and 17. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person, for God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. Let me just say, first of all, this verse has nothing to do with suicide. I hear it about suicide. It has absolutely zero, zero, zero to do with suicide, destroying God's temple. All the yous in this, you, 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 they're plural you. So in English, we don't really have a plural you besides y'all. It should say y'all would be a more accurate translation. Maybe over here on the shelf, we could do like a southern translation. Uh, this says, don't you all, don't y'all know that y'all yourselves are God's temple? It's not you it's y'all we are god's temple americans are so individualistic that's like the only way we we know how to read it but literally in the greek the word is y'all it's not you and y'all together are that temple uh so god's temple is plural in the temple in the old testament i'm just gonna show you a quick picture here boom this would be like a, a model example based on the old testament you can read all the. maybe i'll put it in the devotionals for this week if you want to read all the ways they built the temple the temple was made out of gold silver, precious stones. The, the verses I skipped right before this talk about the work you're doing for the kingdom. If it's of Jesus, if it's of his, his metrics, it's made of gold, silver, precious stones. If it's done for you for selfish reasons, it's hay and stubble and it's all going to burn up. Okay, So that's the background of what he's talking about here. But the point of the temple is God's spirit lived there. There was a place deep within the temple, maybe, I don't know, somewhere in deep, deep in, uh, the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies, you could only enter once a year. It could only be the high priest to atone for the sin of all the people. And if he, he had a, a rope around his ankle and bells on his robe, because if he was unclean, if he had sin in his life and he didn't go through the proper cleanliness, he would drop dead. And there's examples of that happening in the Old Testament. And they'd have to pull him out by the rope because the bells stopped ringing. Very serious stuff to be 
in that type of presence of God. Praise God now we have Jesus and we have the Holy Spirit and the Bible says you are that temple. So destroying the temple is destroying the church. He's talking about destroying the church, destroying the unity of the church. That's what Paul is getting fired up about here. You're the temple. God's spirit dwells in your midst, no longer in the Holy of Holies, but in right now, right here among us, God's spirit is here. Don't take the spotlight away from Jesus. It's his church. It's Jesus's church. And in your life, where's the spotlight? Is it on Josh or is it on Jesus? Is it on Noah or is it on Jesus? Is it on Lucero or is it on Jesus? We all have to ask ourselves that question by the way we live our lives. And, and you, you, you when God, again, the baby bottle, I can think it's normal to drink from this, but you know that it's not, <laughs> okay? It's the same thing with the focus in our lives. Where's, my, where's LaRonda at? Come on up, LaRonda. We're, we're, uh, <laughs> man, we are just... <laughs> We're going we're gonna to transition into a time of communion um, here in, our, in our, cozy, our cozy living room, our mosaic living room here. Um, this last section of the chapter says everything's yours in Christ. Everything's already yours in Christ. I don't want to go into the details because um, we're out of time, but everything is yours in Christ. He's saying you're striving for all these things that Satan has to offer you, all these things you think are so great, like walking around like this is awesome. You're taking selfies with your sweet potato baby food and posting it on Instagram. Look how, <laughs> and, and Paul's saying, you know that in Jesus, you, you have everything. The kingdom, the, the cosmos. This, this word, I said I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'm going to. The word world, the Greek is cosmos. It means cosmos. It means universe. It means everything in existence. When we are co-workers with Jesus, we are co-heirs with him. It is all already yours. I love communion because it's a reminder to me it's a reminder to me that I already have it in Jesus. I want that hole inside of me filled up, and I think that a woman could fill that hole inside of me. I think that money could fill the hole inside of me. I think that numbing it out, however you want to numb it out, more video games, more TV and movies, more social media, more alcohol, more drugs, it's, I can, if I numb that hole out, it'll go away. And I come to the table, the communion table, and Jesus reminds me, you're already filled up. The thing you're looking for, the thing you think that will fill you up, you already have it in Jesus. He says, you already have it in me. So we come to the table to remember Christ. He says, do this in remembrance of me because we forget. Raise your hand if you've ever forgotten Jesus. Amen? Amen. So we do this in remembrance of him. To be filled up, to be reminded we're already filled up and physically to fill up on Jesus.